Today we have Sujan Shah with us. He is a data scientist at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, interested in data engineering and implementing cloud scale solutions. He is currently taking earth science data systems to cloud one at a time. We talked to him about how he landed his internship at NASA, his experience in working with various space organizations across the world, the reason he chose to be a data scientist, along with a couple of tool recommendations for people interested in data science, and his fascinating theory around space force. So let's dive into our conversation and know more about his journey. It's always uh, interesting when you talk to Sujan, like he brings so much uh, knowledge to the table. Uh, always learn something when we, when we, whenever we have conversations. So this, this should be fun. I'm humbled by that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's start from the beginning. Uh, Sujan, uh, why uh, engineering and why DJ? Um, so that I, I guess that goes back a little into, uh, I guess, how, was, uh, how I was brought up. I would say my dad was a big influence in this. Uh, he, like himself, was like uh, an electronics and telecommunication engineer. And uh, he started his own like software company the year I was born. And then throughout the years, while he was working on his company, he would always expose me to, to computers in general. Like, so I would like, you know, from something sim- simple like playing Dave and Mario, just going to his office on DOS, and then, like, you know, doing simple presentations on PowerPoint with animations and that little pin clip and, you know, playing with that. So that got me kind of curious into computers from, like, very early on. And then, like, in my school, I would say, uh, like, in Jiri Samani, we had a choice between choosing computer applications and, uh, like, commercial uh, applications. That's where... I chose it and I'm like, you know what, this is not bad. And uh, I I mean, I could do it without much difficulty. And that kind of got me more deep into it. I would say that that was primarily the start of uh, me trying to do computers and programming. That's awesome. Like in, in, uh, when you were born, uh, your dad was already uh, riding the first wave of software. That's, that's great on your dad's part also. Like very, uh, insightful. So, w- when was the first time like yeah. you would have seen computer uh, at home? Um, I would say uh, my first one was uh, Windows ninety five. So, I would say in the year ninety six, maybe to be, uh, if I could recall, I, I have seen pictures of me <laughs> with the computer with the large <laughs> floppy disk. You you must be uh, four back then. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, true. Yes, four or five. And uh, that, that's my, I guess, first memory. Like Windows 95 is my first memory, like the sound and, you know, when you start up the computer, if you see the logo, that was my first like computer memory. And so then like, we just wanted to ask you already did programming when you were in 11, 12th, like you already had learned some languages and things like that. Yes. So in, um, I guess in my ninth grade is when I, I would say officially learned Java where I was actually tested on it because there were exams. But apart from that, like this basic programming, even within Excel, I would say was taught like by my dad when I was way before, like in eighth and seventh, or even in fifth grade is when I did HTML, uh, like basic websites with that marquee pointers going, doing news flashes and all of that. So that's something I did like in fifth and sixth grade, but the official, I would say, programming language where I wrote my first like calculator, I would say, was in a, a ninth grade in Java. <laughs> I did not hear about HTML till first year of engineering. I think I owe it to the SSE board, I think, or else general disinterest <laughs> in IT, I'm guessing. Uh, but like, uh, so tell us more about your experience in DJ. You, you had some knowledge, not some, a lot of knowledge compared to others in uh, computers already. So how was your overall experience in DJ Sangri? Like going in to DJ, I would say, at least in computers, uh, there were like two aspects. One was, of course, the educational aspect and the other, like I would say, college is also a very social aspect. And going into DJ, I think I only knew one person from computers, uh, his name is Daksh, and we were together in undergrad with, in pace with Atit and everyone. So I just knew that one person. So it was kind of a very different uh, experience for me in the sense of going into an institution where I don't 
like in a class where I don't know anybody. That has not been a case in school. Like I've always stuck with my like group of friends, even in uh, like different classes in school and junior college. Going into DJ, this was a new experience. So <clears throat> it was really nice in terms of the group that I was able to uh, make and uh, all my friends like together. Uh, we kind of helped each other grow. Um, so in that sense, uh, in the social aspect, DJ was like 10 on 10, I would say. And and for many reasons than just like the group that I made. But I think DJ also owing to its, uh, uh, I would say, student population was, I guess, quite innovative in the sense of like uh, with like the festivals, the tech fests and even the workshops uh, that we have, or even talking to like the alums who would come and just give like some presentations. Like I, I, I thought it was very different than other, I would say colleges in Mumbai University, uh, particularly where, you know, I would say they encouraged you, at least the seniors, uh, if not, uh, I would say the courses themselves, they they encouraged a lot to think outside the box. Like I, I would give an example of Chirag Mandot, who was I think the tech fest head when I was in my first year, and he did some robotics workshop, and I was really inspired inspired by him, and the way he was teaching. And then I would say Mayur Parulekar was one of my other mentors and inspiration in the first two years. Like he would like help us get into different workshops. And then even later on going forward, when we like kind of formed our own like uh, startup company, uh, Mayur sir was like really, uh, like he played a critical role in getting us exposure into the entrepreneurship cell in IIT Bombay and also something that he was trying to start in DJ at that time. So like overall, apart from just the educational experience, uh, DJ provided a, a lot more benefit in terms of uh, uh, around the growth i would say like an all-rounder growth uh, going yeah. back to your startup uh, you started uh, a, an e-commerce startup while in dj right and do you want to talk about that how was that experience why did you come up with uh, the idea i believe it was called i love expressions so uh, i would say the first year of dj uh, th- this is a quite of the story of how we got there but the, the, the first year of dj it was all fun and games uh, where we like even in the summer vacation, it was just fun and games, doing nothing. And then uh, again, the the second year where I think we had software engineering as one of our courses or software or web applications, I forget the exact name, where the project was supposed to be like a web application that you make using like Agile or Waterfall, different technology, like different methods of software development. And now, again, this is where I would give credit to, uh, like, Nisar Modi, one of my friends. And, like, he was very well connected via his brother, Shitej, who was also in DJ through different albums. And he would always constantly, again, push our group to be like, let's do something, you know. Why are we just, like, just having fun and games? We, we are in engineering. We should do something. So I guess while thinking about you know what should be our project we thought like if we are going to invest so much time in like a semester to build say a simple application let's just not make like a hospital database management system or like a a hotel management system to learn the thing but why not do something that's a real problem and coincidentally that time one of our friends birthday was coming up and we are like oh shoot, what should we make for him? Like, what should we get him? And that's when we got the idea. You know, it's not just us who's in this problem where a birthday is nearing and they have no idea as to what to give them, but they do want to give them something personalized. And so we are like, why not take this? Like, I had my aunts and, like, friends who would, like, make personalized goods, gifts, or bake, like, cakes, make chocolate, something at home. And they would only spread their, like, spread their uh, name by word of mouth. And I'm like, why not we bring this online and handle delivery? And we would just like sell their products under our brand name. And we would do, we would take care of the, let's call it the last mile type problem where we would do the delivery beyond their circle. And also we try to optimize delivery by giving users an option that, you know, if you, if you need something in three days, 
and you wait for the full three days, your delivery could be cheaper than if you want it now, just because we could combine multiple deliveries in the same area that's going. So we kind of had that idea. We built up a website and then we got into too many things like in terms of talking to some importer who imported goods from China or putting them on our websites, having different bakers from different areas in Mumbai so we could reach a delivery point uh, easily. Like South Bombay was one, East Bombay was another and suburbs like uh, north north of Bombay was one. So like that was a very big learning experience. Like because that started as a small project for a semester and lasted for two years, uh, but that was a dense oh, wow. learning experience for myself. And mm-hmm. so what what uh, are you guys still continuing? What, what's happening? I would say uh, towards the end of DJ, given that you know going in, my mentality was you know try to do everything to find what you like. So I got. I guess we all got involved into many different things. Like apart from just having the startup, I was doing something uh, at IIT Bombay. There was a, like a internship that turned into a semester or a, I guess nine month internship. Uh, and then we started doing our final project at a, another startup. And that kind of uh, diminished our focus. And by then in the last year, we all were like, we all are going to masters in the US because we, right. we thought, something was something was missing we are like okay we have this startup but for some reason we wanted to learn more and i guess that was again the influence of our seniors and even my father like there's there's a story where my dad uh, he could not get a visa uh, to come to the us his student visa was oh. rejected and then he stayed in india and started his own company and so my dad was like you have to go to the US and study. Like I gave him a choice in third year before I prepared for GRE saying, do you want me to like run, like work for your company uh, and, you know, make your software on like upgrade it to the cloud or whatever. And he's like, no, you are going to study in the US. Yeah. And I'm talking to many people, family in the US, it just seemed like, okay, it's a, it's expanding my knowledge coming to the US. So that kind of diminished our focus into our startup. Okay, I see. So what is the IIT internship about? Um, so the IIT internship was about, uh, we kind of worked on developing an uh, IVRS, so the Interactive Voice Response Service uh, for farmers. So these farmers are farmers who are on the uh, Maharashtra Gujarat border, and they kind of have farmers market in uh, Mumbai every Sunday or something, and they would bring in their goods or they would have a middleman who would bring in their goods uh, and sell it. So what we were trying to do with the IVRS system was create a community of these uh, organic farmers by, like, say if the farmers have a question as to, you know, what fertilizer should I use for my potato or tomato? You know, like, this is happening to my plant. What should I do? Uh, so we created, like, a community where in the vernacular language of the farmer, they could just give a call, ring the number. Uh, like you have to realize at that point, farmers didn't have a smartphone or anything. We all probably had Blackberries or iPhones, but they were probably using a uh, normal right. Nokia uh, non-smartphone. So everything had to be done via uh, in like a TTYL, you know, like a interactive uh, voice uh, service. So we made right. that and yes. then uh, they could go on, talk to some other farmer or make a community post, a, like speak a question. If there's no answer, the question gets into a database. And we were working with, the professor at uh, IIT Bombay who was also working on machine translation. Uh, so there were like speech to text and other things, research happening at the back, which I wasn't involved in. But so that that kind of created a community of farmers. Then we connected them with the customers where customers could call that number and be like, hey, I want 10 kgs of tomato or like one kg of potato. What would be the cost? And I would buy it this Sunday. So the farmers would know what to get. So we kind of connected oh, okay. that via IVRS. Yes. Interesting. And this was like 2012, 13? This would have been 13, 2013. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah I, I remember I, I think I was still using um, Blackberry, EBM was a yes. big thing. And I think that was the same year where we won the JP Morgan Code for Good Challenge, like DJ Sangvi. Like, uh, oh, okay. Uh, and it was actually the same technology that I used. Uh, so it was a team of like uh, Richa, Akhil, I guess Manali. No, Richa, Chirag, Manali, myself, and one more guy called Abhishek from Bangalore. And uh, this was the West region of JP Morgan Challenge. And 
we created an IVRS service for Teach for India, where they had a problem statement. And I think the judges liked our idea and presentation. So I guess DJ Sangvi won that year. Hi, this is Atit. You've been listening to us for 10 minutes. And I just wanted to remind you to take a break. Go get some water. Also, thank you for supporting us by listening to our conversations. If you learn anything new today, consider sharing it with a friend or a family member. Show us some love. It helps us a lot. All right, let's continue our conversation with Sajan. Okay, so moving on, you said uh, some part of it, like why did you choose Masters and your family played a role. Can you elaborate on that? Like why... Were you like always in the mindset that you wanted to do master's and then like how did you pick USC to do your master's degree? Um, so going back to the family part, I would say uh, I guess more than half of my mom's side family is in the US and they are either in engineering, or medicine or I guess a few now are in finance as well. So uh, like they would visit India, you know, every every year, every two years, talking to them, they would give a picture of, you know, what's happening in the US. And knowing that I'm in the tech field, like doing computer engineering, like my cousins and like uncles who did computer science would talk to me and be like, you know what, if you were, if you come to the US, this is the opportunity. So in terms of uh, coming to the US, uh, in the sense of studying more, I had a lot of input or I would say push uh, or like a direction from my family yes and in terms of choosing a university so I applied to uh, a bunch of them I would say nine of them and I, I I got into like NCSU Rutgers and USC and in that point I think uh, California made the decision uh, but USC being in California and my dad agreeing to pay for it. He's like, no, uh, it's okay. Don't worry about the money. Uh, was, I guess, one of a very big deciding factor for me to choose USC. And also, I mean, I did some base research about, you know, there were many DJ alums who had studied from the USC. So I did speak to them as well. And a simple research on, you know, who are the professors? Where are they doing their work? Are they affiliated with organizations? So this is some basic research that I've done for all colleges. But from Rutgers, NCSU, and USC, from which I did receive my admit, I chose USC, I guess, heavily because of its location. So, I mean, you have had like a very fair share of education in the US and the the whole experience. And uh, obviously, like the experience in DJ. So, like, what are what are the major differences, both good or bad, that you have like observed regarding the education system in India and that in the US? Let's see. So one thing that now I, I do hear that it's changing in India as well, but not much back then, was uh, the partnership with industry that like uh, the teachers out here have uh, and even how much involved people are like in, in terms of their internships and how open colleges are where you can do an internship while your semester is going on and not just summer. That kind of, I think it's a plus for preparing students to directly, you know, be hands-on and apply what they're learning, uh, I would say, in the same year or near to that term uh, in the industry. Uh, So that's something I really liked about uh, the U.S. And now I I know even in DJ, uh, at least based on what I've heard, that is being encouraged. I know I had to fight a lot in terms of doing the IIT internship because my attendance was dropping too low. And then my dad was called and and there was a whole scene made. But then they agreed that it's fine because it's helping DJ in their like whole alumni game. And also I am I am not scoring bad in my exam. So they were like, that's that's okay. But uh, so they're, they're being more receptive. So that is one big, big difference. Like the professors themselves associated or affiliated with like industry or industrial research or like uh, government sponsored research kind of directed their studies much better. 
uh, be like, well, this is the standard textbook that has been here since uh, ages. And, uh, you know, I, I would not add many, many of my own flavors to it. So I guess the free hand of, you know, changing curriculums out here, uh, not having go through a complete board makes it much faster for professors to give relevant current knowledge to the kids. This, you mentioned courses. So uh, do, do you have any courses that you take while in USC that is still helping you or any other interesting courses uh, that you uh, took while your time at USC? Um, the interesting courses, uh, two of them like really stand out while my time at USC. Now you have to like, also one thing is that when you're doing a master's, you don't take as many courses as you would when you're doing a bachelor's. So from the right. limited courses that I had, I think uh, natural language processing and uh, geospatial information systems, these were the two courses that have helped me long beyond the times of USC. Like even in projects that I did at JPL, and uh, work that I'm doing now in terms of like a lot of satellite products that we work with right now are geospatially tagged and need some geospatial querying. So those basics are helping me even today. And what made you pick those uh, courses? Because like geospatial satellites, that's a very rare course to take, right? Like it's not very common. Like I haven't heard about it. So, like, what yes, made you select that course? That um, so, that would go back to before coming to U.S. My decision to come to the U.S. was, I was pretty clear that the main reason I'm leaving, like, say, a startup or uh, trying to help my dad with his company and all of that was to learn something that I have not done already in my undergrad. So apart from taking the like the basic required courses of like say algorithm, data structures, database, uh, and AI, I'm like okay. After these three courses, I need to do something different that I have not done already. So like natural language processing was something different. Geospatial information systems was different. And this was again with the same ideology that try everything until you find what you like. So the same thing applies to even within the domain, right? Like in computer science, I would like okay, try different things. Like I tried web technologies and I did not like a lot of like say JavaScript UI stuff. So then I realized, okay, let me stay in one stack. Like I don't want to be all stack, like full stack if uh, that would help me. And that's why I took G GIS to answer your question was to just try different things and see what I like. No, that makes sense. And I'll, I'll just add to that, like what I've observed when we go to US is because we have the option to select a lot like different courses there are two parts of what i've observed like the way people do masters one is the safer route where you talk to your seniors and everyone year after year take the same courses same the same professors and they get through their masters with like somewhat average or good gpa and then the second part is you try new courses and different professors and actually try out the masters that you went to the US to do. So those are the two parts I've observed. And based on what you're saying, you took the second one. Uh, and then uh, about your internship mm -hmm. at uh, JPL, like how did you find it? And like, it's very, again, very rare for someone from India going, like studying in US to get into NASA. So like, how did you apply? What was the process? So, so going back to the same ideology that you described right now, uh, like the two ways of doing, and since I was always into like try as many things as I can, and that that ideology has been something since like second year of DJ, uh, since we tried to get ourselves into too many things. Uh, the same ideology applied in my after my first semester at USC in uh, December, like I think it was a December break, where. We all friends, we did a road trip and then it was done. And then I had like two more weeks of nothing. And I'm like, I, and given the momentum, I would say I had from DJ, I'm like, I can't sit doing nothing. Like, yes, the first semester was, uh, you know, acclimatization to the environment, the culture, cooking your own food, taking care of like laundry and all of that. But then come December, I'm like, okay, what should I do? And here again, 
giving credit to Mr. Modi. Uh, he was in India back then uh, working and he was like, you know what, why don't you like do some project right now? Like we've been doing that when we were in DJ. So why don't you do something like that? That's when I reached out to different professors at USC uh, seeking for like a winter project, like just something to work on. No need for like a job or anything. Uh, no official status, just something that I could work. So, uh, I, I sent cold emails basically to many professors and two of them responded. One of them being uh, Chris Matman. And he offered uh, a winter project to work on like web crawling technologies. Uh, it's called Apache Notch uh, for people who would want to know this. But uh, that winter research project ended up being a directed research uh, course that I took for the spring semester in 2015. And while working on it, I did not realize that the team at JPL was actively using uh, this particular project in one of their like projects in at JPL. So come April, they invited me to Washington DC with them for an event. So this is me, first time traveling in the US outside, like just LA, going for an event at DARPA, where there are like 100 other people from different universities uh, across different universities and institutions like, like CMU, Stanford, people from all of there in that one room discussing solving this DARPA challenge. And they are using our tech, like the technology I've been working on. So throughout the week, after the end of the week, they offered me an internship saying, can you join us? Like, we want to work on this. It would be nice to have you as an intern. And I accepted it because I liked that exposure that I had in that one week. Being in that room with some, like people who have kind of really invented certain technologies, like the program, like Apache Spark was invented by somebody from just before that program. And those people were there. A lot of big companies, I would say one would be like, Lattice IO, there's a company that Apple just bought. All of them were founded within that room, and being in that room was a really like changing experience where I had nothing to say no for. I just said yes, I will join you. Yeah, that's nice. So I would say that that's how I got an internship, like doing a directed research, uh, being called uh, to DC for a week, and then being offered a internship. So cold uh, cold emailing helps. That's what you're saying. It could it lead does. to uh, interesting opportunities. It does. Uh, so, talking about JPL, what exactly is the Jet Propulsion Lab, and what's your role in it? So, um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory is, uh, I would say, a part of Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, and they have this uh, campus of JPL, which is, I would say, in the U.S. terms, it's a federally funded development and research center federally funded being like NASA is funding it. So it's NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And a lot of the autonomous uh, space exploration that you see, like things on Mars, like the rover uh, or the helicopter that's being sent right now, or like the satellites that are there on Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, all of those, like the Voyager that, that has crossed uh, the solar system. The, all of that was developed at JPL by scientists at JPL and collaboration with other scientists around the world. Uh, so primarily, I would say, on like robotic space exploration is one thing that JPL does, and also a lot of Earth science uh, in terms of Earth orbiting satellites. And then there are a lot of scientists that we have who use that data um, to create your charts and maps that you see. Uh, as me personally, I I work as a data scientist. I was hired as a data scientist at. Uh, JPL working on this DARPA funded program of DARPA Memex. And uh, now I'm working on like satellite uh, science data systems. That is basically a data management system for when the data comes down from the satellite and then we need to apply science to it. And then at the end is what we give it to different agencies like the uh, Federal Aviation Authority or like the weather forecasting services. Uh, so working in trying to modernize these systems, taking them to the cloud is part of what I do. Apart from that, like automated machine learning is another project that I'm working on. Again, that's a DARPA funded program. Uh, how, how do you have systems do machine learning so that you don't need data scientists anymore? All you need is a subject matter expert and a machine that can uh, solve your problem automatically by 
comparing, doing multiple iterations. So that's kind of what I mean right now. Can you tell us if aliens exist? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> aliens? <Can> it... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I cannot confirm or deny that statement. <laughs> now you're part of the system. <laughs> also, uh, can you like explain like what is the output of your work as if I'm five? Like whatever you said you work on the analytics and process learning as well, machine yeah. learning part of it. So like what is the outcome of the analysis that you do? I would say, oh, let's do over time. I worked on different projects. And if you were somebody who was not technically savvy or something, the first two years that I worked at JPL, I worked, I helped law agencies help kind of uh, look at different patterns in uh, domains like human trafficking, arm smuggling, patent trolling. Um, so imagine a, a lawyer sitting in front of a computer trying to put in a number and we create a web of where all these numbers were shown, like which advertisements, which locations, so that the police will have more leads. Police comes with one number and now they have a, mul like, a multitude of entities on like not only the normal internet, but also the dark web. So that is one of the projects I work on. Right now, the projects I'm working on, if you were someone non-technical, imagine India might experience some drought or flood how do you predict that by well there are satellites that are comparing sea level rise that are calculating moisture content in the soil and these things help weather forecasters or scientists or first responders know that oh this place is getting drier than usual this place is getting wetter than usual the sea level is rising more than usual will my real estate prices drop will my beaches uh, diminish uh, that's the impact of the work that I've been doing. So if you are, if you are like five or say twenty-five and investing in a property on a beachfront, you would want to know if your beach is diminishing or not. Okay, wow. that makes more sense now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so Jen, I just wanted to ask, like, when we go to the US, like, there is a general understanding that if you want to apply for a government program, it's very difficult for immigrants to do that. Uh, so JPL, like, were you like one of the rare cases that got in or like JPL also takes interns who are immigrants or like full-time jobs? There are other employees other than you working for NASA? There, so there are, I would say. Uh, so the, the, the way JPL is different than other NASA centers is that JPL is like an affiliate of NASA, I would say. And like, it's not a direct, NASA facility, but a NASA funded facility. So all the human resource, if you were to put it that way, is managed by California Institute of Technology, Caltech. And Caltech is free to hire non-Americans. Uh, so like foreign nationals uh, are allowed to be hired. So we do have many foreign nationals at JPL as interns and full-time employees. Uh, the only restriction would be that you wouldn't be able to work on certain projects that require a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent residence clearance level. But apart from that, most of the work, I guess all of the work that I'm doing is open source. So anybody in the world can uh, reuse the development that we are doing. Oh, uh, okay. and the data is also open source? So... Uh, the data in its final form is open source, at least from the satellite data, because those are all NASA funded, like taxpayer funded uh, satellites, right? Oh, okay. So all the data is hosted publicly. Oh, interesting. So if anyone wants to do their own analysis about like real estate prices, like you mentioned, they could go out, find the data, run their algorithms analysis. Yes. Right? Do you have, uh, do, do you know what website is it? Uh, where is the data hosted? Well, so different uh, instrument data is in different websites. But in general, uh, if you know what you're looking for, like say water or ocean data, you would search for something called as a data archive center. So like a DAC, D-A-A-C. So you type ocean and you type NASA DAC, you will find the archive center where you might find data from like last 20 years or since whenever they started collecting. So we call them the DACs. There are many different DACs across uh, the US and they all host different type of data. 
So if you know what physical variable you're looking at, you type the name, type DAC, you will get a link to the place. And, and then, they like a special um, hardware to run uh, algorithms on these data uh, or anyone with uh, the latest MacBook Pro could probably uh, do some Well, it depends of- on the, the, the size of data you want, right? Now that comes to my next project that I've been working on right now is trying to take this analysis that people want to do on the cloud next to the data to reduce the transfer of data. Mm-hmm. Now, these data are in like petabytes. Yeah. Like yeah. right now, like NASA and ISRO, in fact, are working on a satellite that's going to probably launch in 2022. Uh, and uh, it's going to get, generate like petabytes of data per week. And then that it's, it's not possible for any normal person with a laptop to do an analysis on the entire life of mission. So you, we are developing technologies to bring these scientists onto the cloud and work with the data on the cloud. And for people interested in data science, like what tools are you using and then what tools you would recommend someone learning if they're just starting? I'd say Python is the biggest. Like I started out with Java, did Scala, uh, a little bit of C++, uh, and what stuck around is Python. Like, all my projects, 100% right now, are Python. You want to do prototype analysis, data analysis, small software. All of this right now, at least in my work and projects, is all Python. So I guess learning basic Python, and there are packages, there are nice tutorials uh, uh, going with Python. So I would say someone to learn Python is good. Even R, but I haven't worked with R enough to have an opinion on it yet. Wow. Uh, just to like suggest and add on to like what you told about usage of your data and the availability of that data. Um, I I think two years back I was in DJ and I was kind of judging this event called Code Shastra that DJ has where all these students like do a hackathon for three days and come up with like a product which, uh, which would kind of help uh, solve any industry problem. And I remember clearly there was this one group which had kind of fetch the data, I think probably from a DAC source uh, to understand like how soil uh, soil across India is and kind of create an entire app where farmers could check the uh, kind of soil that is there in their region and uh, ha- like how they can have like more than one crop that they can grow and also like keep uh, keep a check on the fertility of their soil and like there are a couple of times when they actually burn their entire farm so instead of doing that like kind of alternate between crops it would help them like replenish the whole thing so I think uh, already like the kind of data that you're putting out is making a difference and a lot of young minds are kind of picking this up so kudos (laughs) well that's good to hear I mean that's a nice uh, application of the data so what's next for you? Do you have any side projects you're working on or any anything on the horizon, anything interesting? Um, side projects, uh, to be honest, not as many. I've been, like, at JPL, we usually work on more than one, like, more than two projects, I would say. I'm, I'm involved in four different projects. That has, time, like, it's kind of draining my extra time as well in terms of, uh, like doing research or, you know, trying to just be good at what I'm doing right now. So, like, I have to interface not only for with people within JPL, but, like, by virtue of the DARPA program, I'm, I'm kind of interfacing with people across the U.S., like, as I said, from, like, CMU, Berkeley, Stanford, different places. And then through other projects, I'm interfacing people with the European Space Agency and working in collaboration with them uh, in developing tools that NASA and ESA are using together. So in that sense, in terms of uh, technical, not as much. Although I have kind of gotten into cooking a lot, like apart from just eating outside or takeouts. So I like to do that in my free time where that's my non-screen time, I would say. That I'm not in front of a screen, I'm actually cooking something, trying something new. What's what's your go-to dish? Oh, go-to dish? Always rice and dal. That's like my comfort food. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> every Indian also, ever. <laughs> also uh, what are your thoughts on Space Force <laughs> uh, the movie are you talking about the movie that's coming out <laughs> well the movie is based on uh, the actual force that's 
I don't know being put together. Yeah. Um I I guess politics aside, uh maybe it's useful mm-hmm. like you could make an argument to have that because that's like the next level of uh warfare if you were to put it in a warfare form. But I think that's like uh I would say humanity as a whole should collaborate and explore in space uh together. There are so much to learn uh, and so many unknowns. Like so it in a, in a, our company like in JPL we kind of make fun of the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. So there is something that you right. know you don't know and then there are things you don't know that you don't know. So uh I I I think in terms of making an argument sure you could have a space force that protects your uh satellites and like communications from any uh perceived threat but i think humanity as a whole should go forward with it and i would attribute a lot to spacex out here in terms of the reusable rockets and bringing launch costs down that will help a lot of developing countries and even small universities with small budgets to put research satellites up into space and do their own science so that's like a really good initiative i would say and then you said like you interfaces with agencies in europe so like what does a day in your life look like outside of the whole pandemic situation like how many how many hours per week are you working and then like is it mostly a desk job or you're traveling and things like that oh uh, i would say before like pre covid era uh it's yes mostly a desk job it's on the computer you are kind of programming uh, doing research but i do travel to conferences and uh, meetings integration meetings so every two to three months i would have a travel it's usually a coast to coast travel somewhere in dc maryland virginia uh, uh, is where most of these conferences happen so yes there is travel but not as frequent as uh, one would say so a uh, mostly desk job come work on a project usually work 40 hours a week and uh, dedicate a good chunk of time in a day to a particular project based on deliveries when what is required so project planning yeah do do you have any recommendations for someone who is attending a conference uh, should they attend talks or should they go out uh, to uh, like sit at a bar and interact with uh, uh, people make connection go to parties or what do you think is uh, more helpful in building a network and learning meeting new people so i think both happen together at these conferences so usually when talks are going on there is nobody at the networking area because everybody is going to some talk or the other so if you are attending a conference i guess your takeaway should not only be the talks but yes you should make a connection uh, at least one connection per conference is should be your target uh, one good connection like not just someone like mm-hmm. somebody you should talk to random people yes that's one thing that coming into the us uh, i guess i don't know if we as an indian i would say, indians i would say in general but that's what i've heard like you know we all stick together with our own groups so you would see like the group that forms is always like all, all indians together like in D, in dj right. we would have like if five people from dj came to usc and they were already friends then you know it's just those yeah. five people that stick together So I think one thing that all our roommates we kind of put a ground rule even though we all were from DJ uh we are like when we go to classes we will not sit next to each other so we made new friends and then we branched out That's so great. similarly That's when you go to net similarly when you go to these events uh, you should network that is the biggest goal of these events find a real motive to network also not just shallow networking but like something that you're really interested in and ask genuine questions not just to create a connection but to kind of have a long longing connection i would say and uh, any tips on presentation do you use powerpoint keynote uh, some markup presentation software i have been uh, like we've been using uh, powerpoint like we have to put certain mm-hmm. like uh, logos and copyrights and everything on our presentations but like in tips right. i would say know, know your audience Uh, that's one big thing like you will have to tailor your presentation as to how technical or how high level your audience is so if you're selling a product like you're selling a project selling a feature if you're selling it to managers like sell it in a way that's most relevant to them 
So that has been a right. key takeaway. And also remember that if your presentation is being recorded, there might mm-hmm. be a person who will look at your slide post, like after the fact, and you are not talking right. to it. So make sure you have enough content on the slide that is mm-hmm. relevant and doesn't require you to be speaking to understand what's going on. Yeah. Interesting. Because uh, I think like, there are two camps, right? Like one is like no text at all, just photos. Uh, and so that people listen to you. But uh, then there is also like, like you said, uh, there might be people who are not uh, at the presentation and just need the slide deck. Uh, they should be also be able to get that information. So correct. The yeah, first yeah. camp is a TED talk camp, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Because that's like even while I was presenting here, like uh, I I went to that TED talk uh, camp. Like I read a bunch of things. I was like, yeah, it makes sense that I'm. Uh, I, they should probably focus on me, not my slides. But then I showed it to my CEO. She was like, uh, like we we print these out and then we send it to clients who were not able to make it at the conference. They wouldn't be able to get uh, your points. So. And yeah, that's and we I have a lot of those. Right. That is that is correct. Yeah. Like your. I mean, we have a lot of those yeah. in our like, conferences. So. so do you research on people who are attending the conference? Like these are the set of five people that I want to make connections with. And then you read about them. Or do you have like a general list of questions prepared before going into conference? Or it could be something else. Uh, what's, what does your pre-conference routine look like to help you build the network? It has changed when... I was attending conferences, uh, listening to talks to when I switched to giving talks. So I remember going to ApacheCon in Vancouver, uh, right in my final semester of USC, where I was giving a talk on these web crawling technologies. But I did research on other talks and the, the speakers. And to the areas in which they are working that have interested me in. So yes, there is a pre-conference routine where I research the speaker or even the attendees probably if I have a list of them to my talk or, uh, you know, sometimes they have like company where they're working at at the title. So if I know that this conference that I'm attending is to kind of work in like increase collaboration in earth science on the cloud. So I would look at people working on similar problems or companies and then I would have a general approach towards them in terms of doing a basic research as to what either their company is doing or if there's enough information about them personally, if they have worked on it. Be like, hey, you know, I saw this, you worked on it. Like, can you tell me more about this? I was interested in this because I'm trying to solve a similar problem. And that's kind of a generic template that you would use. Wow, I never, like, I I feel I don't have the guts to just like email someone if I'm interested in what they're doing. I just feel very awkward in doing that for some reason. But based on the entire conversation for the past one hour, I think I should be doing it more for sure. Yeah, I mean, the worst you can get is a no and you already have a no if you don't try. So I guess there's nothing there's nothing below than not yeah. having a connection anyway. So yeah, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Michael Scott. <laughs> exactly. Why <laughs> uh, Yeah. <laughs> Newton said, if I have seen the future, it is by standing on shoulders of the giants. We bring to you these giants in the life of our guests. Our next segment is Top 3, a curated list of top 3 recommendations from our guests. So, so Jen, like, which are your top 3 books and which is one book out of them which you have kind of gifted the most? So... <clears throat> This is a bad thing about me that I'm not a really big book reader and not an avid book reader. Something that I've tried to get into, but I'm more of a visual guy uh, in the mm-hmm. sense about like documentaries. Uh, I, I would rather like watch a one hour documentary and then read books. And I know there are like split opinions about that, but even the limited amount of books that I've read, like I've mostly read books on self improvement. Uh, so like in the recent times, if I can remember, like one of the books that has helped me a lot in like professional career in general was, uh, difficult conversations. Like it's a small book. It's a New York, I think the New York Times bestseller, like that, that book kind of defines how to have like awkward conversations with people and how to like remove any, 
uh, biases or assumptions and try to attack like identities where you can get into a pickle basically so that book has helped a lot in trying to diffuse situations just by having a conversation that is one the other one was uh i think that was by uh dale carnegie i think how to win friends and influence people that one has been a big uh one and then malcolm gladwell's outliers has been one that i have read that has kind of helped me the top 3 i would say given that i have not read as many books but yeah that's interesting so for you so then we'll create a new category question like what are your top 3 documentaries or docu series recommendation wow that's <laughs> so much uh netflix has this good like vox video like vox media basically they have uh i explain really Yes, Vox Explained is on Netflix, and even on YouTube, Vox has many cha- playlists like Vox Borders, mm-hmm. Vox like so. Vox has really good content. I would say yeah. in mm-hmm. I've been using that. What's Then, that guy's name? Johnny Johnny Harris. Like his border Vox Borders is like a he's borders, the host, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So the last season was India mm-hmm. and uh, Sri Lanka and Pakistan, I think. Okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, no that's good. But that, so that's one of them. The other one that I've recently been watching, uh, I think it's in its second season now. It's called Dirty Money. Yeah. On Netflix, that's uh, that's been a good one. And I am like right now, I would say I was biased towards Netflix because I didn't get Amazon Prime soon enough. So I've been on Netflix, but that one was there. And uh, there are many on veganism, I would say, but with a pinch of salt. like cowspiracy has gotten a really big uh uh news coverage and game changers uh, like the the whole veganism thing and climate impact of going vegan but yeah so i would say like dirty money has been one that i've liked vox series has been the other on netflix did you like the season 1 of dirty money or season 2 more I'm going through season two right now, so I haven't finished it, so can't uh, comment much. But uh, okay, yeah. For me, season one was much better. Like I, I slept through a lot through season two. I felt oh, okay. Yeah. So top three podcast, YouTube channel recommendations. Um, I have been listening a lot right now to NPR. like it also this is very regional specific then i would say like in the us uh npr has like npr money and like npr 5 minute news so some things that like i found i i tried to find podcasts that finish in like 15 to 20 minutes because that's the amount of time it takes to reach office and back so uh new york times daily has been one that i listen to the other one uh that i would say ted radio hour is a nice one where you know they interview the ted talk uh, presenter and also put parts of their ted talk that has that has been interesting uh, like before sleeping i kind of listen to ted radio hours but yeah and like i i've been trying to learn more about finance in general because that's something that i don't have a formal education in so npr money or like uh, planet money is what it's called uh, so a lot of finance podcasts is what i listen to i would say so new york times daily for news planet money for the money and ted radio hour for in general topics i think that bleeds yeah. in great with the next uh, next question top three investments you've made <laughs> um uh, i would say after reading a lot and realizing that it's not my full time job to do trading or being enough into research right now uh i've been in like in terms of financial investments if you were to talk it's been mainly the general i would say s&p 500 for example the index market but i guess one of them very random that has grown a lot was amd like th- 3 years ago i invested a sum of money in amd and now it's five times well the money done. so well then yeah <laughs> so amd has been one and then nvidia has been the other but yeah oh yes that also reached some 52 week high recently unlike the name 
we are dwelling deep into our guests thought process rapid fire is our next segment where our guests will answer some quirky some weird but mostly fun questions what is your favorite purchase that you have made which is under 100 dollars uh, a really good pair of shoes i would say you go hiking a lot yes so a, a good pair of like all weather shoes i would say that i was it was a discount i i don't i don't think it's going to be under 100 uh, but i got it during a discount time and that's why it turned out to be very close to 100 i would say not under <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> which pair are those like nike adidas or the timberland like the timberland yeah. shoes i got them from i think somewhere when i was in new york but i, I got it them for them to be like snow mud rain or dry what's one technology that you think will take the future generation by storm and so does it have to be in a particular domain like so there are many technologies like i i uh, 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 it'll be a longer answer <laughs> but i think uh so like in space i would say reusable rockets right like that was one of them uh yeah. like in different domains there are different technologies but if i were to stick to my domain of computer science and this technology has been changing the world uh but we really don't see the complete uh, advantage of it like say in developing countries or like even in india and i would say that is cloud technology in general uh will change the way we interact with any product in the future like that that implies that yes you have a good internet connection at the back so the infrastructure all but imagine like right now in india where people are like losing their documents when they have a flood or a storm or a fire i know the government has started like a dg locker program for example like just leveraging the cloud uh, will help a lot in like in even in devices like iot boom can happen like when you have a cloud like so there are many applications you can stream to the cloud you can do petabytes of like data processing on the cloud so that's something that is yes already changing but we are not seeing the full potential in many countries um if you could invite three people for dinner and have a chat living or dead who would they be but like i would say say bill gates was one of them and then uh warren buffett is the other person who like but i've read his book and stuff but you know actually having a conversation with him would be one and i would say in a fictional one i don't know if you guys know about marvin is like the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy there is this oh, yeah. fictional character called marvin douglas adams yes douglas adams mm-hmm. yes those are interesting okay. choices especially for warren buffett <laughs> i think uh if we ever get a chance to invite like atit me everyone will be on the table with you <laughs> yeah please please send us a uh, invite to that <laughs> dinner dinner party oh, yeah yeah one of friend charlie munger also like that guy is also really dope next question which one tourist attraction you were really disappointed by times square if i were to oh my like, god remember <laughs> like, everyone hates times square <laughs> like times square and hollywood walk of fame heavily overrated places yeah i remember when i was in la like we just did a drive by hollywood we didn't even get out of our car because we 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 just reached there and you we were like there is nothing here so we just kept driving yeah i think times square is very popular more like much more than i would say walk of fame because not many people come to la except for going to like say uh, universal or something but Like given how many people were there at walk of fame in general i i it did i wasn't fascinated much by it. like i i rather loved like well, many small places in central park much more mm-hmm. than like times square okay and going on a tangent like overall for la i think it was underwhelming like i had so high expectation of la and i had this chat with bayani as well and i told him like when i reached like went to la i was just disappointed overall with the city Yeah so I have heard that a lot and I I think I've seen a difference between when I was a student experiencing this city and then when I actually became a local and say another big investment I would say is a car in California without a car you can't really explore much but once I like started driving around in LA uh, being a local I I like 
now I know some places which I would take people to and not let them go themselves. So, mm. yes, as a student, I was disappointed. Like also, like like okay, what is this? But then I realized I did not go to as many places and explore the actual LA scene. Just the tourist scene is okay. It's not that great. Yeah. So is there, there are any? Local- is there any local spot that you would recommend? Uh, I would say like so. I don't know. Did you go to the Getty Villa? No. Getty? So that is an insane spot. Like then there's like the Huntington Gardens. Like you wouldn't believe there are like twelve different gardens inside LA, or Australian garden, desert garden, like a a tropical garden, like Japanese, Chinese, like all of that is there out here. But not tourists don't make it there because it's spread out a lot. and then laguna beach was one of my favorite spots in la county if you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it what would it say and why we can achieve world peace if we change the way we teach history in our schools you only learn from one perspective that's the thing like yeah it's one and i'll tell you the the reason when i like had this mindset actually was way back like at usc also like you know we always had this india pakistan thing when we were growing up not only cricket but the like constant politically motivated like chanting and, and like even in like history books you would hear about mount batten and nehru and jinnah be like oh no we want a muslim country this and that and then i was in a mentor and mentee program at usc and one of my mentees was from karachi and i was having a conversation with him and he was like karachi is just like mumbai like not much it's a port city mumbai that like they're wealthy people they're like you know enjoying their lives out there and they're not much different like people on a personal level don't have any differences and that's when you're like you know what all of this like propaganda that's going that we could achieve world peace if you just teach history correctly to people so yeah that's that's when i kind of started believing in this hypothesis or saying segment is called not the onion presenting four news articles that are mind blowingly ridiculous that they could have been written by the onion a satirical news company however one is a fake article created by us you have to guess which one is not the onion uh the first question uh, first article a million people are pretending to be ants on facebook and it is therapeutic So a group called where we all pretend to be ants in an ant colony has grown from 100,000 members to more than 1.7 million said the creator of the group in one post a group member shared a photo of a pink ice cream with ants crawling on crawling on top of it the poster asked other members to munch with them and take some of the frosty treat to the queen more than 18,000 facebook users responded to the post while pretending to be ants writing comments like norm slur and lift to the queen that was the first article second article a restaurant to seat mannequins at empty tables to make social distancing less awkward a highly rated restaurant in virginia says it plans to fill empty tables with mannequins to make social distancing rules less awkward when customers are allowed to return after the lockdown is ended As restrictions are lifted, the owners said that they will allow guests to only fill up to half the capacity. The other half will be mannequins. The owner says that the mannequins will be decked out in vintage 1940 styles outfits. Uh the third article. With chances of lockdown being extended, MBA college makes Shark Tank season 10 a mandatory part of our syllabus. Open Unis University in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which will soon be starting its ac- academic session, has announced that they will be imparting the MBA, MBA lessons to its students in an unconventional way. The institute has made season ten of the popular reality TV show Shark Tank mandatory part of the syllabus. His syllabus this year. This is probably the first time that an education institute will rely on a streaming platform to impart management and entrepreneurial lessons to students but experts say that after the pandemic this could be a new normal and fourth and last article hong kong shop offers tear gas flavor ice cream 
your guess is among the new flavors at a hong kong based ice cream shop the main ingredient is black peppercorn a reminder of the pungent peppery rounds of fired fa- of fire fired by police on the streets of a semi autonomous chinese city during the months of demonstrations last year it tastes like tear gas it feels difficult to breathe at first and it's really pungent and irritating said one of the customers so those were the four news articles first one being the facebook and and group second being a uh, restaurant panaquins third being mba college and fourth is hong kong tear gas so sujan which one do you think is the fake one I was going to ask you, are we collaborating on this or anything? Uh, no, no, no. My individual <laughs> guesses. <laughs> so, uh, and on Facebook kind of sounds like what people do on Facebook anyway. So, <laughs> that sounds legit. Uh, <laughs> empty table mannequin is in which state, did you say? Virginia? Uh, the article does not say. Okay. And if it did, I uh, haven't written it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No, because a state would kind of inform me whether people can actually do that or not. If it was Texas, people would just open it. They don't need mannequins. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I don't know. Uh, it's good. Like all of them seem true, to be honest. Given that what we have seen in the last year, <laughs> anything is possible. I would go with uh, uh, making Shark Tank mandatory. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. then Haloni uh, I for me firstly I think kudos to come up with such funny <laughs> articles all the time this <laughs> is these are like all of them are out doing themselves uh but yeah uh, I think for me also like think shark tank one like that's just going too far like that just being teachers being extremely lazy like they can still do video tutorials and e-learning sessions <laughs> okay uh Ajit Um, I'll go with the Hong Kong tear gas thing. Hong Kong tear gas. Okay. Uh, the answer is uh, Shark Tank. So, so oh, Jen yeah. and yeah, uh, hello, Ji. Well done. Uh, tear gas is actually true, which is very sad. Bad. <laughs> But uh, oh yeah, one of my friends tried it also. <laughs> What? Yeah, we put it up on our Insta story. Yeah. It has been a pleasure talking to you, knowing about the kind of work that you've been doing and. uh the direct implications of your work i think it's it's extremely motivating for a lot of our listeners and uh, we are looking forward to what's next and uh what's in store for you and thank you so much for being on our show well, thank you for having me on this uh, it's been a pleasure to talk with you guys and i really appreciate what you guys have put together for uh i guess i, I would say the young people also at dj who might be listening to this uh my, my only I would say last. I would say mm-hmm. too long didn't read type thing about the uh, my comments would be get yourself into as many different experiences as you can in terms of finding what you like while early in college. Like that's the time where you will find you are the most productive uh, and you have the most energy to be involved in many different things. Because as you join a full time job, I would say like right now you. it does bog you down in the sense like you have more responsibility and you're accountable so you you kind of spend more time doing that so find what you really like to do spend these like first three to four years of college figuring that out and then it is okay to change your field you don't have to be in the same field if you don't like it like that's the whole point 